Welcome to our live broadcast from the Mountain of God Tabernacle, high atop Mont Eagle Mountain, Tennessee. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and I'd like to tell you that we are a five-fold full gospel interdenominational church which offers contemporary praise and worship, the teaching of God's Word, healing, deliverance, prophetic ministry, and much more. We are located in beautiful downtown Mount Eagle, Tennessee at 331 King Street. That's at the corner of King and Fourth. Our Sunday morning worship service starts at 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, and everyone is welcome. Now, if for some reason you cannot attend our sanctuary, be sure to join our live stream at wildfireonthemountain.com. That physical address again is 331 King Street, or you can watch us live at www.wildfireonthemountain.com. Good morning and welcome to Mountain of God Tabernacle in Mount Eagle, Tennessee. We're glad you joined us this morning by internet or DVD. We are going to start with the sounding of the shofar. Oh 
so faithful. Hallelujah. Well, we're celebrating this morning. Another soul's gone on to be with Jesus. We're so grateful. We trade in our sorrows for joy because we know what's coming at the end, don't we? We read the end of the book and we know how it ends.
ourselves before you, Lord, to receive from you this morning, Father, from your word, from your anointing, Lord, from your habitation. Father, you're invited and honored guest this morning. Father, we ask you to have your will and your way to move among us and through us, Lord. Father, for the glory of your kingdom. Sacrifice of praise, raise my hands, bend my knees. You are my only one desire for you alone, quenching fire. It is 
There's a sweet anointing in the house this morning. When I was back in the control room, uh, a person was sitting there with me, and she's caught up in the spirit. So the anointing is not just for those who are right out here in the sanctuary. So it does go out farther, but sometimes I like to sit on the front row when I'm worshiping because it seems to be stronger. Yeah. In all is will with my soul. You know, you can uh, play a lot of these, I guess you call them church classics and a lot of them are still anointed. The only difference is, are you listening to them to praise the Lord with them? Those are the anointed times. Or is it for your entertainment? And if it's for your entertainment, the song may still be anointed, but you don't partake of it. Because I believe, really, music was originally created for the purpose of worshiping the king. I'm not saying that other musics are bad because that would be like saying it's not good to sing the Star Spangled Banner when that's our national anthem, and it is good. So, but God does have good, acceptable, and a perfect will. And I believe his perfect will with music is that it be worshipful that you use it to worship the king of kings because I got news for some of y'all that might be an American God is not an American he loves America and he loves his people that are in America but he's not an American which means when you get into the eternal when you get into heaven you probably won't be singing the national anthem or take me out to the ball game <laughs> or any of those songs that are American and feel good to, uh, to us and represent our heritage. You will be praising and worshiping the king 24-7, of course, uh, eternity has no time, so instead of 24-7, you could just say forever. And that's what we'll be doing when we're finally with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to say good morning, and uh, my name is Apostle Terry Dunn. For those of you who don't 
know me, and a lot of y'all do know me. I mean, I'm talking about the Internet because we're getting more Internet response. We're getting more people watching us by Internet. We're getting more people uh, purchasing our DVDs. And uh, so my name's getting out there. But when my name gets out there, it's really I'm out there because of him. So it's his name I really want out there. But my name's Apostle Terry Dunn, and uh, I represent him. <laughs> And I want to welcome those who are watching us by internet or DVD. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 9, because we're going to get right on, uh, right into it. And while you turn there, I want to tell you, this is part 5 of my series entitled The Truth About the Book of Acts. And the reason I say the truth is everything in this book, the Bible, is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So if he's the truth, this book is truth because it's really written about him. This is really Jesus in print. That's what it is. So it's it's not just a book. It's the kingdom manual, but it's also holy scriptures. Holy scriptures because it pertains everything in there. Everything from beginning to end um, pertains to Jesus, the uh, Messiah. So taking up where we left off last week with the ministry of the Apostle Paul, let's now look at the ministry of the Apostle Peter. Last week, Paul makes a small appearance in, with his ministry in Jerusalem, but they don't really accept him. They hear all the stories, you know, because he used to be Saul, the one who persecuted the Christians, killed him, in fact. The chief of all sinners is what he called himself, and that was because of what he had done in his past. So he wasn't totally accepted. And like I've showed you in Scripture in the past, when he went to Jerusalem, it was uh, God's intention that he would be the apostle that would replace Judas Iscariot. Of course, Peter, who's always ready to get things done and jump right in there and sometimes would get out there one or two steps ahead of God, and they, uh, he had him do... Uh, do the, the lots or whatever they do, and uh, it, the lot landed on, um, I think his name was Matthias, and had land on somebody. But that wasn't the way God was really communicating with his people after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, because that's Old Testament communication. Now we have in the New Testament, after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, our communication is supposed to be through the prophetic. We're supposed to be able to hear God directly, hear Jesus directly through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So what they did is they uh, chose Matthias, and Paul uh, went to Jerusalem, and because he was had a reputation as Saul, who had killed and persecuted the Christians, they weren't really going to let him have any positioning in the church. So what he does, he kind of retreats. Uh, we don't know a lot about where he went exactly, but he does end up at another church, the church in Antioch. And um, <clears throat> proof of what I'm saying is in the fact that we don't hear anything more about Matthias from that point on. We do hear th some things about the other apostles, even John who wrote the book of Revelation, J James, and uh, of course Peter. We don't hear anything about Matthias but we hear a lot from the Apostle Paul. In fact, he wrote most of the New Testament. So uh, in la the, the previous parts of this series, we saw Paul make an appearance, but he does, and he makes an appearance here, but he kind of retreats, and we'll cover that as we go on, and then we'll next week come back into Paul's full ministry. So reading in Acts uh, Chapter 9, let's start with verse 32. That's where we left off last week. You know, I was really, you know, I analyze, before I get started, I want to tell you what's on my mind and what I've been thinking about and God's been talking to me about. I, uh, I analyze apostolic ministry as compared to other ministries. I'm not saying the other ministries are bad. I'm not saying pastoral ministry is bad or, or evangelistic ministry or anything like that. But I do uh, compare, and I use the Bible to compare. And uh, one of the things that apostolic ministry does is, is 
it's a teaching ministry. In other words, you won't go to a pastorally governed church and hear the preachers teaching like God instructs me and other apostles to teach. Now, the reason is is because a lot of people just come to church on Sundays, and that's why they don't know their Bible. They come to church on Sundays, and they really don't uh, get what we call exposition. Uh, their pastors really don't expound the, the Scriptures. Uh, they'll read a few passages, a few verses, and they'll talk about certain things. They usually save that type of teaching, if they do it at all, for Wednesday nights and other nights of the week. Well, a lot of people don't come. Most of the people don't come on Wednesday nights and other nights. They, they come only on Sundays. So apostolic ministry is teaching the people no matter what day it is. So if you come to this church, it's a Sunday morning. I mean, we, we do deliverance on Sunday morning. I don't know of, uh, anyone else that does that in this area, but that's apostolic. And we teach uh, the depth of the Scriptures on Sunday morning. So when you come here, you can expect, unless the Holy Spirit has something else to do and changes it, and he's done that on occasion. But uh, uh, if you come on Sunday mornings, you can expect to, get, to read the Word and to study the Word. Because a lot of y'all, I'll be honest with you, you don't have the time to put in to study the depth of the Scriptures. You can get up in the morning and read a devotional and move on because you've got to be at work at a certain time or you've got a lot of things you've got to do. Now, that's, that's life. So that's why the Lord, he spoke to me this morning. He says, that's why I have you teach this stuff. Uh, because it, it is kind of, de it is deep, and at times it may be a little bit boring, I'll be honest. And it's only boring because we're busy, busy studying. It's, it's like going to school. I remember, oh, I loved going to school, but there was times when it was boring because you were learning. And, you know, and your, your, your human nature really wants to have fun. It really doesn't want to learn all the time. So... That's apostolic ministry, and I wanted to get that clear up front because that's why we're making DVDs and we're on the Internet and we teach these deep things on Sunday mornings when we could do it on a Wednesday night. But, you know, we've done Wednesday nights, and, and sometimes nobody would hardly show. And God's not going to waste certain messages on just a couple people. Now, if a couple people come and he says, do it, then you do it. But he's trying to get this apostolic message out to the masses. So Acts chapter 9, look at verse 32. That's where we left off. And it came to pass as Peter passed, uh, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, that means he went to wherever everybody lived. I mean, that's their living quarters. So he went where people lived. It says he came down also to the saints which dwelt in Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. So this man had been sick for eight years, and all he can do is lay in his bed, sick. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise, and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Now, where did he learn that? He learned it from Jesus. Remember? Two, two instances I can think of. One was, I think, at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, the man was trying to get in the troubled waters, you know, or whatever waters they call it to get healed, which really wasn't angels coming down and doing that, but I won't go into that. But they had enough faith to think that they got in the water first to get healed, and with that kind of faith, you, a lot of them probably did get healed, but he couldn't get in the water fast enough. And Jesus was just walking along, says, take up your bed and walk, you're healed, and he did. And then there's another time when uh, some friends of a person who was bedridden, they lowered him in his bed down through the roof, and Jesus said, uh, said, take up your bed and walk. You're healed. And he did, and he was healed. Of course, the Pharisees didn't like that. They contend with that. I mean, these, these guys, these Pharisees, I tell you, any church that doesn't really believe in hands-on healing and doing the things Jesus did, and they're not doing them, I mean, they're Pharisees. I mean, because what, it, what they're saying is, we don't do that because we don't believe in it. I mean, that's what you do. If you believe in something, you do it. You get up in the morning, you believe you can drive your car, well, you get in your car and you drive. I mean, it's that simple. Now, if you don't believe you can drive your car, you're just going to stay at home and you're going to say, we don't, I don't do that. I don't drive. You know, there's a lot of other examples. 
So that's uh, why when I say it sounds like I'm pastor bashing at times or denominational bashing at times, and sometimes I'll admit I think I am. And I ask God to forgive me for it, and I repent because there are people, there are pastors that are doing the best they know how to do. But, you know, this book tells you what you can do. And if you don't try, at least try to do it, then you don't believe it. And if you don't believe this book and what it says you can do, I mean, Jesus said they'll come after him and do the same things he did and even greater things than he did. That's Jesus himself saying you can do this. That's what Peter's doing. He knows Jesus said that. He was with Jesus when he said it. So he knows he can do this. He knows he can say, take up your bed and walk. You're healed. And, of course, the guy does it. But you don't see that in the church, and I don't understand it. Because my uh, view of this whole thing is if he said you can do it and you don't think you can do it, guess what? You're calling him a liar. Think about it. And yet they still go on with this playing church. Oh, we don't lay hands on anybody. Oh, we don't believe in deliverance. Oh, Jesus did it. Yeah, but that's Jesus. Yeah, but he said you can do it too. You, You see, this is all apostolic ministry is pretty much getting what God says through the prophetic, and he reveals the scriptures to you. But after he reveals it, you can see this is just logic. I mean, this stuff is like a no-brainer. So why are they making it so against what Jesus said? Why are they in contention like the Pharisees were in contention when he said, take up your bed and, and walk? And the reason is they're somewhat controlled, if not completely controlled, by the devil. I mean, there's only two kingdoms. And if you're not controlled by the kingdom that this manual represents, then you're controlled by the other kingdom. See, there you go again. That's just logical. It's just a no-brainer to me. Verse 35, and all the dwelt in Lydda and and Sharon saw him, that's the guy that was healed, and turned to the Lord. That's called power evangelism. Power evangelism is, you know, is, is doing what Peter did. It's laying hands on people and getting them healed. And then the people who don't know if there's really a God see that, and, and at least they'll say, well, there's something going on because that person was sick or that person was blind or that person had a disease or that person had cancer and they ain't got it now. So something's going on. It plants the seeds that causes them to eventually get saved, power evangelism. Verse 36, now there was at Joppa a certain disciple. Notice the word disciple. You, you women pay attention to this. There was a Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. So according to this verse, Dorcas was a disciple. Now, if she was a disciple, which Scripture says she was, then she would have also been allowed by God to be trained in the apostolic. And after being trained in the apostolic, she would have then been allowed by God to become a full-fledged apostle. This is a woman. An example of what I'm talking about, you can find in the Old Testament. That would be like Deborah, Deborah in the Old Testament. Deborah was apostolic, and actually she was an apostle because she went up and went to war with uh, Barak and won the war, by the way. Now, that's why God did not want her to die before her appointed time, which we'll see as we we read on. Verse 37, and it came to pass in those days that she uh, she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, that means washed her body, they laid her in an upper chamber, and forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter rose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by weeping, stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. In other words, she made them, uh, they were wearing them all. She made them all when she was alive. It says when she was with them. Now, what she was doing was she was making tunics, very Jewish, and Talits, extremely Jewish. Now, let me explain the importance of this. These Jewish garments represents who they are. 
I mean, that's why when you see Jewish people worshiping, especially they've got a tallit on. It tells you they are Jewish. And, of course, there's a lot of things about the tallit that I won't teach right now. But it Jesus wore one, and so it represents uh, the kingdom or the uh, nation, nation of the Jews, the nation of Israel. Now, Hitler, the devil used him to defile who they were. Because you remember, he had them wear these yellow stars on their outfits. He was mocking them. He was mocking the Jews. He was mocking Jewish culture. And, of course, the devil is behind that. So that's how important um, Dorcas is here. Now let's go on to um, verse 40. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning, him to the, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. That's Dorcas. Dorcas, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, he learned how to do this from Jesus, who prayed before he said, Lazarus, come forth. See, Peter, as an apostle, was following Jesus in his ministry. He carried, or was carrying Jesus' ministry. That's why I tell you, apostles are, if you want to know if it's a true apostle, see if they're carrying Jesus' ministry. Because if they are, then they're true apostles. So our job is to carry Jesus' ministry. Look, 41. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. In other words, look, she's alive. She was dead, now she's alive. Verse 42. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. There you go again, power evangelism. If you want to get people saved, raise somebody from the dead. You know, and a lot of people say, well, I couldn't do that. I heard one lady say, only Jesus could do that. Yeah, Jesus is the only one who can do it, but he does it through you. Because he said they'll come after him and do the same things he, he did and greater things than he did. And he preached the kingdom, healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead, and cast out devils. See, what I'm trying to tell you is you can raise up the dead. Now, you may not know how, and you may be a little uh, nervous about it, but if someone who's, you know, of young age, I mean, it ain't their time to expire, if they were to just pass out and die in front of you, you can lean down and you can speak life into their body. I mean, I did it only once because I only had one person die in front of me. I mean, it's quite simple. You command their spirit to come back into their body. Now, if they're like... My mother-in-law, who just passed away this week, she's 99 years old. Lord spoke to me and says, don't even do that because at her age, it's her time to go. It's her appointed time. And at her age, she would just be back in the hospital again and have to go through that suffering uh, rather than go on and be with the Lord, which is what has happened, is what she did. So I'm telling you, you can raise people from the dead. Why? Because it says it. Because Jesus personally said it. All you got to do is step out in faith and do what Jesus did, and you'll see it happen. And by the way, if you're going to bring somebody back to life, you command their body to come back. Whatever their name is, command the spirit of whoever they are, their name, to come back and speak life. Just uh, go over it over and over and over. I command life to come back into this body. I command, and you watch. Their heart will start beating, and the EMTs will be shocked but they'll know you did it in the name of Jesus, therefore you're doing power evangelism. See, the church doesn't do power evangelism anymore. The church in general isn't even powerful anymore. They're not even empowered anymore because they're too busy playing church, and they've been playing church for centuries. So I'm telling you, you can raise a person from the dead. Then it goes on to say, and it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon the Tanner. So he stayed on there, and he probably preached more. So according to this passage of Scripture, God valued the life of Dorcas, the female disciple, enough to send a full-fledged apostle on a special mission to bring her back to life for the purpose of her fulfilling her apostolic call to do kingdom work. Because, see, that's kingdom work. Salvation is of the Jews. This book was written by Jews. Jesus was a Jew. All the apostles were Jews. So when you do something that's predominantly Jewish, that's kingdom work. That's what she did. Now, what that work was, 
was that she demonstrated God's love by making, King James calls it coats and garments, but it was really tunics and pelites and so forth. She was making those coats and garments for everyone who were followers of Yahweh. In other words, God considered it to be such a great work that he brought her back from the dead to continue on with it. Now let's read on in chapter 10 and see where the Gentiles, through Peter's ministry, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost along with the Jews. So look at verse uh, 10. Let's see. Well, let's start verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now this is a Roman soldier who is a Gentile. It says he was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. Let me tell you about that. If you fear God, you will make all your house holy ground. That's what they're saying. Here's a soldier who knows war, knows killings, and knows all this stuff, but he has the fear of the Lord, so he makes his house, which is a Gentile house, he makes it holy ground. He says, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Then in verse 3, he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour, that's about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Do you realize your prayers and your alms, what you give uh, to his kingdom, uh, is a memorial. That means See, when we set up a memorial, it's to remember certain things. What he's saying is God remembers that, and God remembers it probably forever. So, I mean, it's a memorial, and this is a Gentile. It says, and now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon a tanner, whose, name is by, uh, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do, and when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed. He called two of his household servants and a devout soldier. You got to remember, he has a soldier. He has a, a, a group of soldiers that he commands. It says, and um, uh, he called one of the devout soldiers of them that waited on him continually. And when he had de declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, that means the next day, as they went on their journey, and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the house to pray about the sixth hour. That would have been noon. And uh, he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. <coughs> Excuse me. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great, great sheet knit at the four corners. Knit at the four corners. You get that? He's probably seeing a giant tallit. Because you know, he's Jewish. Knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Because he's Jewish. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God has cleansed. That call not thou common. This was done three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean, so he didn't really quite yet know, it's, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. In other words, the Holy Spirit's saying, they're there to get you. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing. In other words, don't even have a second thought about it. Just go. God's in control. For I have sent them. Then Peter went down to, uh, to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned by God, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee unto his house, 
and to hear words of thee. In other words, God told him to go get Peter because he's going to speak. He's going to speak this, the word of God. He's going to preach. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow, the next day, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So he took some of his Jewish entourage with him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. In other words, he's having a meeting. He's calling people, saying, a preacher's coming, an apostle. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter took him up, saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were came together. So he has a big congregation waiting for Peter because he knows God said that Peter has something to tell him. Look at verse 28. And he said unto them, you know how that it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. In other words, I'm a Jew and it's unlawful for me to even fraternize with a Gentile. And, of course, uh, Cornelius was a Roman soldier, Gentile. He says, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So, so Peter now has the picture or the translation of what his trance is all about. Now, there's both a primary interpretation and a secondary application to Peter's vision. In the primary interpretation, it refers to no man being common or unclean if God cleans him up. However, in the secondary application, it also refers to certain foods that are unclean being made clean by God, which is why Paul in Colossians 2.16, uh, I believe it was, said, let no man judge you according to what you eat. It's also why we need to pray over the food that we do eat. When we pray, we need to ask God to cleanse it because, I mean, it's filled with a lot of stuff that will really uh, kill us before our time. We know that. Now, the reason I know what I'm talking about here is because God could have used another means by which to get his message across to Peter. In other words, he didn't have to tell uh, Peter to kill and eat the unclean animals unless he also was offering us a secondary application that refers to the food that we eat. God is God. He can do it any way he wants, but that's the way he chose to do it. And that's why it has a secondary application that refers to food. Now look at 29. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, that means without any objection, any reluctance, as soon as I was uh, sent for. I asked therefore for what intent ye have sent for me, and Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, uh, an angel possibly, or it might have been Jesus himself in a vision. You know, he's in a trance, so he's like somewhat out of the body. I, I, I teach on trances and other uh, in our prophetic training, but it, now it's not the time to cover that. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard and thine alms are had in remembrance, and others, and others their memorials, in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon the Tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God to say or to preach. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, first thing said was, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, let me explain that to you. Because that scripture has been quoted out of context. What this verse really means is that God's respect for the Gentile nation as a whole is equal to that of the Jewish nation as a whole. In other words, it doesn't refer to God respecting every individual equally as wrongly used by many Christians to show that God doesn't favor one person over another. And I've used it myself in error. That's because Scripture shows that he does favor those who fear him and who are obedient to serve him. Cornelius is one of them. And by that, I'm referring to people like Cornelius, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and the list goes on all throughout the Bible. So in no way does this verse cancel out 
God's favoritism towards those who choose to keep his commandments. See, I had that, uh, I asked that question to myself a long ago, and a lot of times God don't answer my questions right away because he knows I'm going to find in the scripture eventually when I preach in that area. You know, oh, God, he's, God is no respecter of persons. No, what he means is God is no respecter of nations as a whole. He is a respecter of persons because if you're a person who's sold out to God and keeping his commandments and working for the kingdom uh, to, to the best of your ability compared to a carnal Christian, don't you think there's favoritism there? Sure it is because the person who sold out to God uh, requests certain things. I was talking to Brother Todd the other day. He says, how come you you all have so many cars? I said, well, God just kind of like makes a way for them to be given to us, you know? And that's, see what I'm saying? So is that that favoritism? Yes, it is. He's favoring us over, say, uh, someone who's maybe not as sold out to God. And, and you know, I'm not going to put down anybody because some people, you know, can get by in one car. But we can't. We need three cars. I mean, this is America, and you can own three cars, and God gave us three cars, and one's a Cadillac. Why do we need three cars? Well, I'm here preaching, and my wife's at the funeral home making arrangements for uh, the burial of her mother, and our Cadillac's sitting at home. We're saving the miles because when we go do ministry trips, and I tell you, when we go uh, uh, in in uh, Philadelphia, when we pulled up to the the Hyatt, uh, yeah, it was a Hyatt. A hotel. I mean, real nice, exclusive place. Carol says, wow, I'd like to live here. This is the most uh, exclusive hotel I've ever seen, Hyatt. But when we pulled up, we pulled up in a Cadillac, and I'm telling you, they treat you differently than if I had pulled up in my old junky van that I used to have, and I love that van. It, it works really well for a musician, but they really treated us different. I mean, we went in, and our room, rooms weren't ready, but of course, we drove up in a Cadillac. They made them ready pretty quick. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. No, I didn't ask God. I never prayed for a Cadillac because I never thought I'd own one. Never thought I'd need one. That's before I was in ministry. The only reason God gave me one is because we are in ministry. So there is favoritism. And if you want that favoritism, you've got to sell out to God. You got to say, God, I'm going to serve you. So you are the master that I serve, and I'm the servant. I serve you. So my job is to serve, and your job is to what? Have favor with me. It's that simple. This thing that we're all equal, the only way we're created equal is in God's eyes that we have equal opportunity to get into heaven. Now, there's other ways we're created equal, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor male, nor female. But, you know, we're not even created equal in that because there's certain things a male can do that a female can't do, but there's certain things a woman can do that a man don't want to do. Do you hear that? How many of you guys clean house? Yeah. How many of you guys do the dishes? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So we're not created equal because my wife doesn't mind doing that. I don't know if she likes it. I never ask her. I maybe ask her something if I ask her, she'll say, no, I hate it. <laughs> you got to do it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> so where are we at here? Uh, we're about like 28, I believe, right? Uh, 40, uh, we're around, around 34. Yeah, 35. But in every nation, see, he's talking about nations as a whole. That's both Jew and Gentiles. But in every nation, he that feareth him, see, the fear of the Lord. See, carnal Christians don't have the fear of the Lord, or they wouldn't be carnal Christians. Now, I'm saying carnal Christians because I, I hope they're still saved. I hope they're Christians. But if they got one foot in the world and one foot in God's kingdom, it's questionable because that shows they do not have the fear of the Lord. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, y'all pay attention to this. Contrary to what most of us have been taught concerning salvation, what this verse is saying is that not only is God not a respecter of of nations, but every nation, whether it be Jew or Gentile, can be saved and enter into heaven, it says, with him, by embracing the fear of the Lord and by working righteousness. That's what it says which means that you can be saved by works. 
but only when you have the fear of the Lord that goes along with it, like Cornelius. Luke 12, 5 says, be not afraid of him, or them, I should say, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do, but fear him, which after he has killed, has power to cast you into hell. In other words, the fear of the Lord is a requirement for salvation. So that's why I think maybe these carnal Christians aren't even saved because they don't have the fear of the Lord. If they had the fear of the Lord, they wouldn't be doing all this worldly stuff, you know, under grace. And most of the time it's what we call cheap grace. Once saved, always saved, so now I can go sin. Oh, God will forgive me. All I got to do is go out and sin and ask God to forgive me. And, of course, the Bible says he will. But there's going to come a time when that carnality in your life will pull you over and totally out of the kingdom. And, of course, certain denominations believe once saved, always saved. That's not true. I can find scriptures to say the opposite. I mean, you can go to Revelations. Near the end of the book of Revelations, God threatens you. If you don't do what I say, is pretty much what he's saying. I can remove your name from the Lamb's book of life. Well, if he can remove your name from the Lamb's book of life, then you can lose your salvation. You see? Again, here we are. Wisdom, knowledge, and it's a no-brainer for me. Hmm. So let's see. Let's, we're at verse 36, I believe. Yeah. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching Jesus by Jesus, Preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, and others you know about it, because they've all heard it, which was published throughout all Judea and be began from Galilee after uh, the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. This is what Peter is saying to them. This is what God wanted him to say, which is why he's there. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Others, they crucified him. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people. Okay, isn't that favoritism? Not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick, the quick and dead. That means the living and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that uh, through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Verse 44, while Peter yet spake, while he's preaching these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the words and they of the circumcision, that's the Jews, and they of the Jews, these are the Jews that came with Peter, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter were astonished, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. That gift is the gift um, that I think the Apostle Paul talks about in uh, Romans 1, 11. Verse 47, can any man, you all pay attention, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? He's talking about water baptism which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. Now, according to this verse, water baptism had nothing to do with them being saved because they were already saved in order for them to have received the infilling of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues before they were water baptized. A no-brainer again. This is one of the more than 150 verses that disproves the doctrine that water baptism saves. Water baptism does not save you. It's only you declaring yourself a disciple of Christ by going under the water and leaving the old man down. When you come back up, you're a new creature in Christ. That's all it is. It's symbolic. See, God works with symbolism. That's why prophetic acts, it's all symbolism. And God does that, and that's all it is. Verse 48. Let me see here. Uh, it says, uh, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. In other words, they wanted him to stay with them. So according to what we just read, a person can be saved through the fear of the Lord and by working righteousness, but not by water baptism. 
How do you think that he saves a person in the bush? You know, I, I, we've run across scriptures where God actually said that, you know, this is a person who's never had a preacher come to him. They've never been in a church, yet God can save them. Why? Because they have the fear of God. They just ask God, where are you? Show me who you are. And he shows himself to them, and they have the fear of the Lord. And then they start uh, doing righteousness. Righteousness means they start doing things that keeps them in right standing with God. And they're saved. So salvation, you don't have to be in a church. You don't have to go through the prayer that they lead you through. All you got to do is decide, hey, I'm going to serve you, Lord Jesus. I want to be in your kingdom. Forgive me of my sins and let me serve you. Now teach me how to serve you. And you're saved. And then from that point on, you'll be obedient to what the Word says you're supposed to do. That's all. It's that simple. The church has made it into a big, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, production? Somewhat. Now, I'm not saying uh, the, that the salvation prayer is altogether wrong, even though Jesus never gave an altar call. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong because if God tells you to give an altar call, you give it. In fact, I'll give it right now. If any of y'all want to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can get anybody in here to pray for you, and they'll just lead you through a prayer, and all you got to do is then from that point on serve him. That's the altar call. I'm not going to go through this big thing where we're going to do this and that and that. I'm just telling you, you got to make the decision. And you make the decision to serve him and tell him you're serving him and start serving him, and guess what? You're saved. Now, subsequent to their salvation, they also received the infilling of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues before being water baptized. Now, let's read on chapter 11. We've got two more chapters we're going to read, then I'll be through. Verse 1, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, that's the Jews, contended with him. These are the Jewish uh, Pharisees and others. They're contending with him, saying, Thou went into men uncircumcised and did eat with them? But Peter uh, rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it. He's expounding it by order. It means he's giving them uh, chronological order as to how it happened. So he expounds it unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying in a trance, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descended as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even, un even to me, unto uh, the which when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed uh, beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. This is what he's seeing in the sheet that's coming down. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, No, Lord. For nothing common or unclean has, uh, has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times. I guess it took three times for Peter to get it. Probably would have took me three times or more. And behold, immediately there were three men already come into the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me, and the Spirit bade me to go with them, nothing doubting. That means don't hesitate. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. So there were six of his entourage went with him. And we entered into the man's house. This would be Cornelius' house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in the house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and thy house shall be saved. You know, look at that. He's going to tell you words why, where you're going to be saved. He's not going to say uh, so that uh, this person can baptize you in water so you'll be saved. I mean, you know, <laughs> the church has got to wake up. They've got to start reading what it really says instead of believing what they've been told by their hierarchy. A hierarchy. And, and like I said, you know, if water baptism saved you, then we could all just go home and take a shower and, hey, we're going to heaven. That's not the case. It says, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. He's talking about Pentecost. They have Pentecost. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed, this is John the Baptist, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. In other words, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a higher baptism than water baptism. That's what he's saying. See, John only had the power to baptize in water, whereas Jesus, through his death and burial and resurrection, is able to baptize us in the Holy Ghost with 
the evidence of speaking in tongues. So when I got a church and they don't want to believe in this infilling of the Holy Ghost, oh, that tongue thing, guess what? They're going against God's Word. So they settle for less. I mean, I know people from a denomination that believes, I mean, I personally know them, that water baptism saves, but they don't want nothing to do with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And I can find in Scripture where he's saying that the infilling of the Holy Ghost is greater than what John did in water baptism. He's not telling you to throw water baptism out. He's just saying this is greater. Why? Water baptism doesn't give you the power that the infilling of the Holy Ghost gives you in Acts 1.8. But you should receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. See? So what this is all about is he's saying you need power. Sure, you get water baptized as a disciple of Christ. That's a good thing. But you need power because kingdom expansion comes through the use of that power. Kingdom expansion doesn't come through water baptism. That's just you saying, well, I'm, I believe in Christ now, and I'm a follower, and that's good. But now, if you get water baptized, and then you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you become a disciple and a follower of Christ that's empowered to expand the kingdom. Simple. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure not the only person ever figured this out. There has to be others. I know there are. I just don't run into them around here, I guess. Huh? <laughs> Golly. All right, verse 17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift, he's talking about the infilling of the Holy Ghost, as he did unto us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? In other words, he's God and I'm not. And if he wants to give the Gentiles the uh, infilling of the Holy Ghost, then who am I to stop it? That's what he's saying. As God, he can do whatever he wants to do, and that's what he wanted to do, because we were engrafted in, Romans 11, into the Abrahamic covenant through Christ. Look at 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. That's true. He's granted us repentance unto life, along with the Jews. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. That's because Stephen had been killed by Saul, by the way. It says uh, they traveled as far as Phoenix and Cy Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So this, this group went to the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus. So they decided to go... This other group go to the Gentiles. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Power of evangelism. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, this is Barnabas, he was a good man, and what? Full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people uh, were added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. So Barnabas is now going to seek Saul, because Saul had gone back to Tarsus after he went to the Jerusalem church, and they really didn't accept him. And they definitely didn't give him the place that he's supposed to get as one of the inner twelve, which was given to Matthias. And when he had found him, so he found Saul, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. So here they are with the church in Antioch for a year, and they're teaching. Uh, it says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. That actually was a negative term or title they gave them, Christians. Like we could give certain people negative terms in our language. But later on, it was changed. I'm, you know, I'm happy to be a Christian because the word Christ is in it. But it used to be a negative thing. Oh, those are them Christians. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth. That's a famine. He's saying there's going to be a famine coming, and it does come. Through a famine throughout the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. So they're having a famine, but Antioch is able to send food and sustenance to the church in Jerusalem. Now look at verse 30, which also they did and sent it to the elders 
by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So according to what we just read, Barnabas and Saul, who later became Paul, by the way, Barnabas and Saul, for lack of a better term, ran errands for the church at Antioch before they became full-fledged apostles. In other words, they were serving at a lesser capacity while they were still being apostolically trained to be apostles. See, if you want to be an apostle, you got to serve at a different level before you get there. God just doesn't, now God may tell you through prophets that you're called to be an apostle, but he doesn't the next day make you an apostle because there's a lot of things you're going to have to learn. And how do you learn it? You learn to do it. I mean, I told you how I got to be called into an apostle. I was a praise and worship person. Paul was the praise and worship leader. Then Paul was called out. I became the praise and worship leader. And then uh, I became the assistant pastor. And then I was called into the prophetic. And when I learned what that meant, six months later, they called me into the office of the prophet. Then I studied and figured out what that meant. When I say study, I'm talking about reading the Bible. And then uh, they called me uh, into the apostolic. So I had to study and see what that meant. Another couple years or more. And then finally I was called on the mountain. There's some prophets that came out of Atlanta, Buddy Crumb's church. Prophets called me, one out of 50 men that were there at a men's retreat, called me into the office of the apostle. See? So I didn't get there overnight. So if you want to be an apostle, don't expect to get there overnight. Now, there was a price I had to pay, and God made way for me to uh, uh, pay it. And one of the prices was I had to go down to Huntsville where our church was, the church that trained and ordained us for six years. I mean, the only time I missed is uh, whenever we can maybe go to visit my grandchildren or in Virginia or go to Florida to visit my family. But I was there every Friday and Sunday. And uh, Pastor Paul Diedrich was there as well. So there is a price you got to pay. Now, if you can't pay that price, don't even think about it because it's not going to happen. God will allow you to be somewhat apostolic by just doing what <clears throat> Jesus did, you know, walking in his footsteps and, and uh, carrying on his ministry to a certain degree. But if you want to be an apostle, and I don't recommend that you need to be an apostle, you know, because I would you understand all that it entails. You may not want it. But if you really want it, you have to go for it, and you have to pay the price. Now, let's uh, read the last chapter, 12, and I'll be through. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, these are the non-Christian, Pharisaic Jews, it pleased them, and he saw that. So he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So it's during the uh, celebration of Passover. So he couldn't kill him on Passover, so he puts him in prison. And when he had uh, apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers. That's about 100 soldiers. He had 100 soldiers guarding him to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, see the word Easter? Capital E. This is the only translation you'll see it in because it's a pagan holiday. <laughs> but King James was like Constantine, who's the reason we call it Easter. But what Constantine did is when he made uh, Christianity the religion of Rome, he wanted to make everybody happy, so he puts the pagan holiday of Easter, which is where they uh, worship the goddess Estar. And, and then the Jews who uh, had the uh, worship uh, or celebrated the Passover, he put it all on the same day, make everybody happy. You can't mix oil and water. That's what he was doing. So that, when uh, King James comes along, they just interpreted that as his Easter. Because I got a feeling that the people who interpreted the King James Version, and I preach out of it, so I'm not saying it's not the Bible. I'm just saying there's things in the King, J King James Version that was put in there because King James wanted the canon written and closed with his name on it before he died. So there was another motive involved in this. That's the only time you'll see Easter. It should say the celebration of Passover, but it doesn't, and if you know that, that's fine. The problem I have with it is I went down to a church. They uh, wanted me to come down and minister, and when I got down there, uh, he says, well, you can only preach out of the King James. Well, I, I preach out of the King James anyway, but I use other Bibles as reference. But, I mean, he was so staunch in that, I thought, King James only. It's like it's the only Bible, and I'm telling you, it's not. 
But I preach out of it because most people are familiar with it. Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So he has 24-7 uh, prayer coming up from people in the church. And when Herod uh, would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So there's a hundred guards there. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. That means he woke him up and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. They just fell off. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals, and others get dressed. And so he did, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. So the angels having him follow him. And he went out and followed him, and knew not that it was true which was done by the angel but thought he saw a vision so in other words he doesn't really he just think he's dreaming you know um, let me explain something about that uh, there's two uh, instances i can recall where angels came to me and in both situations you think you're dreaming you're up and awake and you don't realize that that was an angel that visited you and did certain things for you till he's gone. So they have the power to make you not um, be absolutely normal, I guess, for lack of a better term. And I think the reason is because you'll start asking these stupid questions maybe and take up this time. I don't know the reason, you know. But it wasn't until the angel had departed that I knew because in my case, when I saw my guardian angel, I was asleep and saw the bright light hit me like the lights up here. I can close my eyes and still see them. And so I opened up my eyes, and there he was standing, and he's, he's, uh, he's white-skinned, if you will. I mean, I, you know, just glowing, bright light. And I thought, wow, this is a neat dream. And I closed my eyes and go back to sleep, and it's still there. So I opened my eyes again, and he's still there. And I thought, wow, this is a long dream. <laughs> so I closed my eyes again. Happened three times. And I open up, and I'll tell you what he was doing. He was standing there just like this, and he was looking out like that. And later on, the Lord said, what he's doing is he's looking out, protecting me. He's looking out into the universe. He's protecting me. And then uh, after the third time, I closed my eyes and went to sleep. And then the next morning, I woke up, and that's immediately what I knew. I knew that I had a visit visitation of my guardian angel, but I didn't know it until after he had already departed. Now, another thing happened where an angel saved me, saved me from an uh, let's just call it an auto accident because I was about ready to rip the doors off of my trailer that I had on behind the, my van that the door was still open and I didn't know it. And this person walks out of the bushes, I mean, in a place where there ain't even no place to walk out of, much less walk in, and he speaks to me in a language that I didn't understand, but I knew what he said. See, now, right away, I, if, if I'd have been normal, again, for lack of a better term, I'd have said, this has to be the language of heaven you're speaking because I don't understand a word you're say, saying, but I know everything you said. What he told me is your back gate's open. Close it. Well, meanwhile, a security cop had pulled in front of me because he thought I was stealing something, you know. I'm there uh, getting my trailer hooked up in a – it's an area where they lock up their boats at a at a apartment complex, you know, chain and all that. And I had the key, went in and got my trailer, and he thought maybe I was stealing something. He pulls in front of me, and uh, – I go back and I close my trailer, and then I see this being who was an angel. Looked like a human, though. And he walks right into the bushes again. I mean, it was so thick you couldn't even get in. There was no trail. And I thought he was with the cop, you know. I said, um, is he with you? And this is after he's gone now. He says, no, I thought he was with you. And I said, no. And so the cop goes over and investigates where he went because he thought, well, he kind of looked like a street person. So he's going to go and investigate, see if they're, you know, living in the woods, you know, or whatever they're doing, the, the security cop. And he couldn't even get through the bushes to find him. And I got in the car. He moved his car where I could get out because, see, he blocked me because if I was stealing something, he was ready to block me. And he moved, and I drove out, and I got maybe, oh, 20 feet down the road, and all of a sudden I knew I was in the presence of an angel. That's what Peter's experiencing right here. Verse 10, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate and that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them in his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street and forth with the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, see, that's what I should have used that terminology instead of being normal when I come to myself. He says, when he come to himself, he said, now I know 
of a surety that the Lord has sent an angel and has delivered me out of the hands of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. In other words, that angel, he knew had come to save him from being killed. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. This would be John Mark's mother, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel called to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. In other words, you're crazy. Peter's in prison. But she constantly affirmed that it was so. Then said they, It's his angel. You know, I mean, Peter's in prison, so that's probably just his angel. Why would his angel be coming? I don't know. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James. Now, this is James, the brother of Jesus, because James, the brother of John, is already dead. And to the brethren, and he departed and went into another place. Now, as soon as it was day, in other words, he, he departed. He didn't really want to hang around there. Now, as soon as it was day, and there was no small stir among the soldiers that was, uh, was become of Peter. Uh, so that's why he left, because he knew when they found out he was gone, they'd probably hunt him down. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. See, the Roman law, the reason they put so many soldiers around him is Roman law says that if this prisoner gets loose and escapes, you're going to pay the price for him. So they knew that they would lose their life over this. And that's uh, what uh, almost happened. Remember when uh, it was uh, Paul and uh, Silas in the Philippian jail, I believe it was, and the jailer had an earthquake, and the jailer was, um, you know, he was all a little bit concerned and scared because if they would have escaped, it would have cost him his life. But remember, and Paul says, oh, fear not, fear not, we're all still here, and we're going to stay. And, and what he did is he brought Jesus into their life. So that's what happened here. And it says, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and there abode. And Herod was uh, highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. Now, these are two uh, cities that are fighting each other, and Herod's, you know, he's upset with them because they keep fighting each other. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, so he's like a mediator, they desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. So Herod was feeding these countries because there's a, there's a drought going on, and they're coming to him. And it says, and upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an or. Uh, oration unto them. So he's talking to these two warring cities. And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of God and not of man. So they th saying that Herod's God. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him. That means he slapped him down because he gave not glory to God and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. So he was slapped down, and he must have laid there until his body just started decomposing because it says he was eating of worms, and that's why he died. So God takes it serious when you're someone like Adolf Hitler who claims to be God. And I just think of all the despots in history that have said that. And, you know, it talks about heaven where the worm dieth. I mean, hell, where the worm dieth not. That's where I'm sure most of them have went, not all of them. But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So after having fulfilled their mission, this is Barnabas and uh, Saul, their mission to deliver food to the church in Jerusalem. They returned to Antioch along with John Mark, where they continued their apostolic training for a period of approximately 13 more years. That's because it was 14 years total as uh, referenced in Galatians chapter 2, and they'd already spent one of the years at the church in Antioch. So approximately 13, it might have been less. Now next week we we're going to read about uh, their release. I'm talking about Barnabas and Saul the release from the church at Antioch as full-fledged apostles. Hope you all got something out of this. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for the word that comes out of the kingdom manual where it's truth. Your word is truth. It's Jesus in print. We also thank you for the revelation of your word that's stated in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We ask it all in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ and Messiah. And everyone in agreement said, Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining our live broadcast here from the Mount of God Tabernacle. We hope to see you soon, and may you have a blessed day in the Lord Jesus Christ.